Everybody dies, don't they? Everybody Some dies. come back, don't they? Isn't that Everybody so? Dies, you tried to get into the locked drawer today, didn't you? you tried How to get do into the, the dead come, come back, Mother? What's the secret of the dead come back? So here we are live again for the third time to try and get everything right. So this story we're going to read tonight is from the Damnable Tales collection, which I'm still reading. And it's this one here, Laura Silverbell. So it's now eight o'clock. So we will begin. In the five Northumbrian counties, you will scarcely find so bleak, ugly, and yet in a savage way, so picturesque a moor as Dardale Moss. The moor itself spreads north, south, east and west, a great undulating sea of black peat and heath. What we may term its shores are wooded wildly with birch, hazel and dwarf oak. No towering mountains surround it, but here and there you have a rocky knoll rising among the trees and many a wooded promontory of the same pretty because utterly wild forest running out into its dark level. Habitations are thinly scattered in this barren territory and a full mile away from the meanest was the stone cottage of Mother Cark. Let not my southern reader who associates ideas of comfort with the term cottage mistake this thing is built of shingle with low walls. Its thatch is hollow, the peat smoke curls stingingly from its stunted chimney. It is worthy of its savage surroundings. The primitive neighbours remark that no rowan tree grows near, nor holly, nor bracken, and no horseshoe is nailed on the door. Not far from the birches and hazels that straggle about the rude wall of the little enclosure, on the contrary, they say, you may discover the broom and the ragwort in which witches mysteriously delight, but this is perhaps a scandal. Malkark was for many a year the sage farm of this wild domain. She has renounced practice, however, for some years, and now, under the rose, she dabbles. It is thought, in the black art, in which she has always been secretly skilled, tells fortunes, practices charms, and in popular esteem is little better than a witch. Mother Cark has been away to the town of Willardon to sell knit stockings and is returning to her rude dwelling by Dardell Moss. To her right, as far away as the eye can reach, the moor stretches. The narrow track she has followed here tops a gentle upland and at her left a sort of jungle of dwarf oak and brushwood approaches its edge. The sun is sinking blood red in the west. His disc has touched the broad black level of the moor, and his parting beams glare athwart the gaunt figure of the old beldam as she strides homeward, stick in hand, and bring into relief the folds of her mantle, which gleam like the draperies of a bronze image in the light of a fire. For a few moments, this light floods the air. Tree, gorse, rock, and bracken glare, and then it is out and grey twilight over everything. All is still and sombre. At this hour, the simple traffic of the thinly peopled country is over, and nothing can be more solitary. From this jungle, nevertheless, through which the mists of evening are already creeping, she sees a gigantic man approaching her. In that poor and primitive country, robbery is a crime unknown. She therefore has no fears for her pound of tea, and pint of gin, and sixteen shillings in silver which she's bringing home in her pocket. But there is something that would have frightened another woman about this man. He is gaunt, sombre, bony, dirty, and dressed in a black suit which a beggar would hardly care to pick out of the dust. This ill-looking man nodded to her as he stepped on the road. I don't know you, she said. He nodded again. I never seed you nowhere, she exclaimed sternly. Fine evening, Mother Cark, he says, and holds his snuff box towards her. She widened the distance between them by a step or so, and said again sternly and pale, 
I have now to say to thee, whoever thou beest, You know Laura Silverbell? That's a by Nyam the lass's Nyam is Laura Lou, she answered, looking straight before her. One name's as good as another for one that was never christened, mother. How know ye that? she asked grimly, for it is a received opinion in that part of the world that the fairies have power over those who have never been baptised. The stranger turned on her a malignant smile. There's a young lord in love with her, the stranger says, and I'm that lord. Have her at your house tomorrow night at eight o'clock, and you must stick cross pins through the candle, as you have done for many a one before, to bring her lover thither by ten, and her fortune's made. And take this for your trouble. He extended his long finger and thumb toward her with a guinea temptingly displayed. I have now to do with thee. I never see thee afore. Get thee away. I earned nee gold of thee, and I'll take nin. Away with thee, or the find end it'll mack thee. The old woman had stopped and was quivering in every limb as she thus spoke. He looked very angry. Sulkily he turned away at her words and strode slowly towards the wood from which he had come. And as he approached it, it seemed to her to grow taller and taller and stalked into it as high as a tree. I conceited there would come some o' it, she said to herself. Farmer Lou must get it done nesh sunder, that owd loupy. Old Farmer Lou was one of that sect who insisted that baptism should be but once administered and not until the Christian candidate had attained adult years. The girl had indeed for some time been of age not only, according to this theory, to be baptised, but if need be, to be married. Her story was a sad little romance. A lady some seventeen years before had come down and paid Farmer Lou for two rooms in his house. She told him that her husband would follow her in a fortnight and that he was in the meantime delayed by business in Liverpool. In ten days after her arrival, the baby was born. Mal Clark acting as sage femme on the occasion, and on the evening of that day the poor young mother died. No husband came. No wedding ring, they said, was on her finger. About fifty pounds was found in her desk, which Farmer Lou, who was a kind old fellow, and had lost his two children, put in bank for the little girl, and resolved to keep her until the rightful owner should step forward to claim her. They found half a dozen love letters signed Francis, and calling the dead woman Laura. So, Farmer Lou called the little girl Laura, and her soubriquet of Silver Bell was derived from a tiny silver bell, once gilt, which was found among her poor mother's little treasures after her death, and which the child wore in a ribbon round her neck. Thus, being very pretty and merry, she grew up as a North Country farmer's daughter, and the old man, as she needed more looking after, grew older and less able to take care of her. So she was, in fact, very nearly her own mistress, and did pretty much in all things as she liked. Old Mal Clark, by some caprice for which no one could account, cherished an affection for the girl who saw her often and paid her many a small fee in exchange for the secret indications of the future. It was too late when Mother, Clark, Mother Clark reached her home to look for a visit from Laura Silverbell that day. About three o'clock next afternoon, Mother Clark was sitting knitting with her glasses on outside a door on the stone bench when she saw the pretty little girl mount lightly to the top of the stile at her left under the birch against the silver stem of which she leaned her, her slender hand and called, Mal, Mal, Mother Cark, are you alone or by yourself? Aye, Laura, lass, we can be close enough if you want a word with me, says the old woman, rising with a mysterious nod and beckoning her stiffly with long fingers. The girl was assuredly pretty enough for a lord to fall in love with, only to look at her, a profusion of brown rippling hair parted low in the middle of her forehead almost touched her eyebrows and made the pretty oval of her face by the breadth of that rich line more marked. What a pretty little nose, what scarlet lips and large, dark, long fringed eyes. Her face is transparently tinged with those clear marillo tints which appear in deeper dyes on her wrists and on the backs of her hands. These 
and the beautiful gypsy tints with which the sun dyes young skins so richly. The old woman eyes all this, and her pretty finger, so round and slender, and her shapely little feet, cased in the thick shoes that can't hide their comely proportions, as she stands on the top of the stile. But it is with a dark and saturnine aspect. Come, lass, what stand ye for atop at wall where folk may chance to see thee? I have a thing to tell thee, lass. She beckoned her again. And I have a thing to tell thee, Mal. Come hither, says the old woman peremptorily. But you munna give me that creeping. I winna look again in the glass of water, mind ye. The old woman smiled grimly and changed her tone. Now, honey, get the down and let me see the canny fias. And she beckoned her again. Laura Silverbell did get down and stepped lightly toward the door of the old woman's dwelling. Take this, said the girl, unfolding a piece of bacon from her apron, and I have a silver sixpence to give thee when I'm going away, yam. They entered the dark kitchen of the cottage, and the old woman stood by the door, lest their conference should be lighted on by surprise. Before you begin, said Mother Cark, I soften her patois, I must tell you there's ill folk watching ye. What's old Farmer Lou about? He doesn't get the sir, the clergyman, to baptise thee. If he lets Sunday next pass, I'm afraid you'll never be sprinkled nor signed with a cross while there's a scar above, sky above us. A goy, exclaims the girl, who's looking after me. A big black fellow as high as the kipples came out of the wood near Dead Man's Grike, just after the sun went down yesterday evening. I know well what he was, for his feet never touched the road while he made as if he walked beside me. And he wanted to give me snuff first, and I wouldn't have that. And then he offered me a golden guinea, but I was no sick orpy, and to bring you here tonight and cross the candle with pins to call your lover in. And he said he's a great lord and in love with thee. And you refused him? Well for thee I did, lass, says Mother Cark. Why, it's every word true, cries the girl vehemently, starting to her feet, for she had seated herself on the great oak chest. True, lass, come, say what you mean, demanded Mal Cark with a dark and searching gaze. Last night I was coming yam from the wake with old Farmer Dykes and his wife and his doubt and Nell, and when we came to the stile I bid them good night and we parted. And you came by the path alone in the night time, did you? exclaimed old Mal Clark sternly. I wasn't afeard. I don't know why. The path yam leads down by the waters of old Howarth Castle. I know it will, and a dowly path it is. You'll keep indoors a nights for a while, or you'll rue it. What saw ye? No freetin', mother. Nout I was feared on. You heard a voice calling your name. I heard nought that was dow but the hully hoo in the old castle waste, answered the pretty girl. I heard nor see nought that's dow but mickle it's canny and gladsome. I heard singing and laughing a long way off. I consated and I stopped a bit to listen. Then I walked on a step or two and there, sure enough, in the pie mag field under the castle walls, not twenty steps away, I seed a grand company, silks and satins, and men with velvet coats with gold lace striped over them, and ladies with necklaces that would dazzle ye, and fans as big as griddles, and powdered footmen, like what the shearer had behind his coach, only these was ten times as grand. It was full moon last night, said the old woman. So bright it would blind you to look at it, said the girl. Never an ill sight, but the devil finds a light, quoth the old woman. There's a running brook there. You were at this side, and they at that, and did they try to make you cross over? A goy did they, nought but civility and kindness, though, and you must let me tell it my own way. They was talking and laughing and eating and drinking out of long glasses and gold cups, seated on the grass, and music was playing, and I keeking behind a bush at all the grand doings, and up they gets to dance, and says a tall fella I hadn't seen before, you must step across and dance with a young lord that's fallen in love with thee, and that's myself. And sure enough, I keeked at him under my lashes, and a canny lad he is, and to my taste, 
though he be dressed in black with sword and sash, velvet twice as fine as the cells in the shop at Golden Friars, and keeking at me again for the corners of his eyes. And the same fellow telt me he was mad in love with me, and his father was there, and his sister, and they came all the way from Katzjen Castle to see me that night, and that's the other side of Golden Friars. Come, lass, you know, Mafflin, tell me true. What was he like? Was his face grimed with soot, a tall fellow with wild shoulders and looked like an ill thing, with black clothes, maced in rags? His face was long, but well favoured, and darker than a gypsy, and his clothes were black and grand and made of velvet, and he said he was the young lord himself, and he looked like it. That'll be the same fellow as see the deadman's grike, said Mal Clark, with an anxious frown. Hoot, mudder, how could that be, cried the lass, with a toss of her pretty head and a smile of scorn. But the fortune teller made no answer, and the girl went on with her story. When they began to dance, continued Laura Silverbell, he urged me again, but I wouldn't step over. It was partly pride, because I wasn't dressed fine enough, and partly contrariness or something. But gar I wouldn't, not a foot. No, but I more than a half wished it at the time. Wail for thee, though didn't cross the brook. Hoity toity, why not? Keep at home after nightfall, and don't you be walking by yourself by daylight on any light, lang, lonesome ways till after you're baptised, said Mal Clark. I'm like to be married first. Take care that marriage won't hang in the bell rub, said Mother Clark. Leave me alone for that. The young lord said he was most daft in love with me. He wanted to give me a canny ring with a beautiful stone in it. But drat it, I was sick and hopping, I wouldn't tack it, and he a young lord. Lord indeed, are you daft or dreaming? Those fine folk, what were they, I'll tell you, dobbies and fairies. And if you don't do as you bid, they'll take ye, and you'll never get out of their hands again while grass grows, said the old woman grimly. Odd white it, replies the girl impatiently. Who's daft or dreaming No, I'd been dead with fear if it was any such thing. It couldn't be. All was so lovesome and bonny and shapely. Well, and what do you want of me, lass? asked the old woman sharply. I want to know, here's a sixpence, what I should do, said the young lass. T'would be a pity to lose such a mara, eh? Say your prayers, lass, I can't help you, says the old woman darkly. If you go with the people, you'll never come back. You mustn't talk with them, nor eat with them, nor drink with them, nor take a pin's worth by way of gift for them. Mark well what I say, or you're lost. The girl looked down, plainly much vexed. The old woman stared at her with a mysterious frown steadily for a few seconds. Tell me, lass. And tell me true. Are you in love with that lad? What for should I, said the girl with a careless toss of her head and blushing up to her very temples. I see how it is, said the old woman with a groan and repeated the words, sadly thinking, and walked out of the wood, out, out of the door a step or two and looked jealously round. The lass is witched, the lass is witched. Did you see him since? asked Mother Cark, returning. The girl was still embarrassed, and now she spoke in a lower tone and seemed subdued. I thought I seed him as I came here, walking beside me among the trees, but I can say it was only the trees themselves that looked like rinning one behind the other as I walked on. I can tell thee now, lass, but what I tell thee afore, answered the old woman peremptorily. Get ye him, and don't delay on the way. And say your prayers as ye gar, and let none but good thoughts come nigh ye, ye, and never put a foot outside the doorstone again till you go to be christened, and get that done Sunday next. And with this charge, given with grisly earnestness, she saw her over the stile and stood upon it watching her retreat until the trees quite hid her and the path from view. The sky grew cloudy and thunderous and the air darkened rapidly as the girl, a little frightened by Mal Clark's view of the case, walked homeward by the lonely path among the trees. A black cat, which had walked close by her, for these creatures sometimes take a ramble in search of their prey among the woods and thickets, crept from under the hollow of an oak, 
and was again with her. It seemed to her to grow bigger and bigger as the darkness deepened, and its green eyes glared as large as halfpennies in her affrighted vision as the thunder came booming along the heights from the Willardon Road. She tried to drive it away, but it growled and hissed awfully, and set up its back as if it would spring at her, and finally it skipped up into a tree where they grew thickest at each side of her path, and accompanied her high overhead, hopping from bough to bough as if meditating a pounce upon her shoulders. Her fancy being full of strange thoughts, she was frightened, and she fancied that it was haunting her steps and destined to undergo some hideous transformation the moment she ceased to guard her path with prayers. She was frightened for a while after she got home. The dark looks of Mother Cark were always before her eyes and a secret dread prevented her passing the threshold of her home again that night. Next day, it was different. She had got rid of the awe which with Mother Cark had inspired her she could not get the tall, dark-featured lord in the black velvet dress out of her head. He had taken her fancy. She was growing to love him. She could think of nothing else. Bessie Hennock, a neighbour's daughter, came to see her that day and proposed a walk towards the ruins of Haworth Castle to gather blueberries. So off the two girls went together. In the thicket, Along the slopes near the ivied walls of Haworth Castle, the companions began to fill their baskets. Hours passed. The sun was sinking near the west, and Laura Silverbell had not come home. Over the hatch of the farmhouse door, the maids leant ever and anon with outstretched necks, watching for a sign of the girl's return, and wondering, as the shadows lengthened, what had become of her. At last, just as the rosy sunset gilding began to overspread the landscape, Bessie Hennock, weeping into her apron, made her appearance without her companion. Her account of their adventures was curious. I will relate the substance of it more connectedly than her agitation would allow her to give it, and without the disguise of the rude Northumbrian dialect. The girl said, that as they got along together among the brambles that grow beside the brook that bounds the Pymag field, she on a sudden saw a very tall, big-boned man with an ill-favoured, smirched face, and dressed in worn and rusty black, standing at the other side of a little stream. She was frightened, and while looking at this dirty, wicked, starved figure, Laura Silverbell touched her, gazing at the same tall scarecrow but with a countenance full of confusion and even rapture. She was peeping through the bush behind which she stood, and with a sigh she said, Isn't that a canny lad? A goy see his bonny velvet clothes, his sword and sash. That's a lord, I can tell you, and well I know who he follows, who he loves, and who he'll wed. Bessie Hennock thought her companion daft, See how lovesome he looks, whispered Laura. Bessie looked again and saw him gazing at her companion with a malignant smile, and at the same time he beckoned her to approach. Don't go! Go not near him, he'll wring thy neck, gasped Bessie in great fear, as she saw Laura step forward with a look of beautiful bashfulness and joy. She took the hand he stretched across the stream, more for love of the hand than any need of help and in a moment was across and by his side, and his long arm around her waist. Fare thee well, Bessie, I'm going my way, she called, leaning her head to his shoulder, and tell good father Lou I'm going my way to be happy, and maybe at long last I'll see him again. And with a farewell wave of her hand, she went away with her dismal partner, and Laura Silverbell was never more seen at home or among the copies in the wickwoods the bonny fields and busky hollows by Dardell Moss. Bessie Hennock followed them for a time. She crossed the brook, and though they seemed to move slowly enough, she was obliged to run to keep them in view, and she all the time cried to her continually, Come back, come back, bonny Laura, until, getting over a bank, she was met by a white-faced old man, and so frightened was she that she thought she fainted outright. 
At all events, she didn't come to herself until the birds were singing their vespers in the amber light of sunset, and the day was over. No trace of the direction of the girl's flight was ever discovered. Weeks and months passed, and more than a year. At the end of that time, one of Malkark's goats died, as she suspected, by the envious practices of a rival witch who lived at the far end of Dardel Moss. All alone in her stone cabin, the old woman had prepared her charm to ascertain the author of her misfortune. The heart of the dead animal, stuck all over with pins, was burnt in the fire, the windows, doors and every other aperture of the house being first carefully stopped. After the heart, thus prepared with suitable incantations, is consumed in the fire, the first person who comes to the door who passes by it is the offending magician. Mother Kark completed these lonely rites of dead of night. It was a dark night, with the glimmer of the stars only, and a melancholy night wind was soughing through the scattered woods that spread around. After a long and dead silence, there came a heavy thump at the door, and a deep voice called her by name. She was startled, for she expected no man's voice, and peeping from the window she saw in the dim light a coach and four horses with gold-laced footmen, and a coachman in wig and cocked hat turned out as if for a state occasion. She unbarred the door, and a tall gentleman dressed in black waiting at the threshold entreated her as the only sash farm within reach to come in the coach and attend Lady Lairdale, who was about to give birth to a baby, promising her handsome payment. Lady Lairdale? She'd never heard of her. How far away is it? Twelve miles on the old road to Golden Friars. Her avarice is roused and she steps into the coach. The footman claps to the door, the glass jingles with the sound of a laugh. The tall, dark-faced gentleman in black is seated opposite. They're driving at a furious pace. They have turned out of the road into a narrow one, dark with thicker and loftier forest than she was accustomed to. She grows anxious, for she knows every road and bypath in the country round, and she's never seen this one. He encourages her. The moon has risen above the edge of the horizon, and she sees a noble old castle. Its summit of tower, watchtower and battlement glimmers faintly in the moonlight. This is their destination. She feels on a sudden all but overpowered by sleep, but although she nods, she is quite conscious of the continued motion, which has become even rougher. She makes an effort and rouses herself. What has become of the coach, the castle, the servants? Nothing but the strange forest remains the same. She is jolting along on a rude hurdle, seated on rushes, and a tall, big-boned man in rags sits in front, kicking with his heel the ill-favoured beast that pulls them along, every bone of which sticks out, and holding the halter which serves for reins. They stop at the door of a miserable building of loose stone, with a thatch so sunk and rotten that the roof tree and couples protrude in crooked corners like the bones of the wretched horse, with enormous head and ears that drag them to the door. The long gaunt man gets down, and his sinister face grimed like his hands. It was the same grimy giant who had accosted her on the lonely road to Dead Man's Grike, but she feels that she must go through with it now, and she follows him into the house. Two rushlights were burning in the large and miserable room, and on a coarse ragged bed lay a woman groaning piteously. That's Lady Lairdale, says the gaunt dark man, who then began to stride up and down the room, rolling his head, stamping furiously and thumping one hand on the palm of the other, and talking and laughing in the corners, where there was no one visible to hear or to answer. Old Mal Kark recognised in the faded, half-starved creature who lay on the bed, as dark now and grimy as the man, and looking as if she had never in her life washed hands or face, the once blithe and pretty Laura Lou. 
The hideous being who was her mate continued in the same odd fluctuations of fury, grief and merriment, and whenever she uttered a groan, he parried it with another, as Mother Cark thought, in saturnine derision. At length he strode into another room and banged the door after him. In due time, the poor woman's pains were over, and a daughter was born. Such an imp, with long pointed ears, flat nose, and enormous restless eyes and mouth. It instantly began to yell and talk in some unknown language, at the noise of which the father looked into the room and told the sage femme that she should not go unrewarded. The sick woman seized the moment of his absence to say in the ear of Malkark, If ye had not been at ill work tonight, how could not have fe he could not have fetched ye? Take no more now than your rightful fee, or he'll keep ye here. At this moment he returned with a bag of gold and silver coins which he emptied on the table, and told her to help herself. She took four shillings, which was her primitive fee, neither more nor less, and all his urgency could not prevail with her to take a farthing more. He looked so terrible at her refusal that she rushed out of the house. He ran after her. You'll take your money with you, he roared, snatching up the bag still half full, and flung it after her. It lighted on her shoulder, and partly from the blow, partly from terror, she fell to the ground, and when she came to herself, it was morning, and she was lying across her own doorstone. It is said that she never more told fortune or practised spell, and though all that happened sixty years ago and more, Laura Silverbell, wise folk, wise folk think, is still living and will so continue till the day of the doom among the fairies. Everybody dies, don't they? Everybody so dies, don't they? Isn't that so? You tried to get into the locked drawer so? today, didn't you? you tried How to do the dead come back, Mother? You? You What's the secret of the dead come back? Book because of the illustrations. Because um, it's great, actually. The illustrations are really good. I hope you can see this. There we are. So, some of that. Um, Dialect was rather challenging, even for me. Um, so, absolutely, I love fairy stories. They're my favourite kind of stories. So that I really like. That it was a good story. I wish the dialect hadn't been so broad, because I was wondering. Uh, at times, I struggled to understand it. Now it's only up the road from me. So yeah, it was a good. It's a good story, a fairy story. It reminded me, do you know what it reminded me? It reminded me of that film, of the Neil Gaiman story, Stardust, where um, that bit where they're, they're in disguise and pull, the goats are pulling the, the carriage. Um, yeah, it will, uh, it will end up as a live stream. Um, and I think, the, I think the sounds work this time. And I think the pictures work this time, so that's good. So the next thing is, I'm going to do a premiere on Monday, uh, so it's pre-recorded, of the pomegranate seed by Edith Wharton. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so I get distracted, it's my ADHD. So uh, yeah, so pomegranate seed, Edith Wharton, Monday night, 10 p.m. London time, I'm not sure what that is everywhere else. It may not be 10 p.m., maybe 9.30, so it's, it's actually announced. Yeah, it reminded me, there's a story we did called The Phantom Coach, which is a Victorian story, slightly later than this one. And um, it's the, the Northern Moors again. Yeah, the sound I think is better because I'm, I'm, I'm using a lav mic. Yeah, there we are. Yes, it was good. Anyway, you know me, I can just, ADHD, I know it's bad, um, but never mind. Um, so yeah, that's it. I'm just gonna witter on now. So we've got a premiere. I'm going to do a, a, just a question and answer because the problem I have when I'm reading is I can't see the the I know is the um, 
I can't see the comments and I can't reply to them. So I figure if we do one whereby we, there's a bit more toing and froing, uh, that will be better. I don't, uh, Antonia Barber, I don't think I know that one. But yeah, fairy stories. I even thought of doing a separate fairy story. Mm. Yeah, it's, yeah, 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 yeah. Technically the sound is better. Yeah, okay. Anyway, I'm going to go. Thank you all for turning up. Um, oh, we haven't seen, <laughs> he's here. Jack is here. Come on, focus on Jack. I've got to put him in front of my face before the camera will focus on him. There he is. Yeah, he's just keeping me company. Um, there we go. Yes, 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 all of those. Edith Wharton, Neil Gaiman, absolutely. Okay. Right, that's it. Okay, guys, see you. I'll be around. Premiere on Monday, all right? Yeah, the Pyramid, well, yeah, another, it's from this same book. So I'll just, I'll do some credits actually before I go. So, this is the book they're drawn from. It's actually sold out at the moment, but I think they'll probably reprint. And the music, of course, is from Which Face 4, um, and that's a link by the Hartwood Institute. And they give me permission, which I'm very grateful for. Yeah, anyway, okay, great. Bye, everybody, because I can just go on forever, so I won't. Bye-bye. <laughs>